The moment Moscow's western suburbs erupted with the wail of air raid sirens, the city understood something had gone terribly wrong. At exactly 11pm on November 17th, 2025, radar operators in a Pantsir S1 battery stared at their screens in disbelief as 40 fast-moving targets appeared at once, small, erratic, and coming in low. To them, it looked like chaos blooming out of nowhere. And yet, this panic was only the surface of a strike, months in the making, set into motion by decisions taken just hours earlier. But to understand how Moscow reached the brink in a single night, the story must rewind. At 6pm, the Russian president had ordered a massive strike on Ukraine's power grid, a display that cost tens of millions and plunged Kyiv into a night of darkness. State television celebrated the outcome, portraying it as a demonstration of dominance. Commentators mocked the outages. That celebration would be short-lived. The attack ignited a retaliation already prepared, one built around misdirection, attrition, and an understanding that Russia's pride could be turned into its weakest point. Inside Russia, just 15 miles from Moscow, a Ukrainian special forces team was already in place. Their vehicle, a battered potato truck that looked as unremarkable as any other, waited quietly on a rural road. Hidden inside the false wall of its cargo compartment were dozens of FPV calibre drones. The team's orders were clear. Unleash a swarm that would trigger a predictable Russian reaction, a reaction Ukraine had studied with precision. At 10.45pm, the truck's side panel slid open, revealing only the faint glow of a laptop screen and the silhouettes of operators readying the drones. 40 calibre units, small, agile and deadly at close range, were activated. One by one, they were tossed by hand into the cold night air. For a brief moment, they hovered together like a cluster of metallic insects, aligning themselves, communicating. Then the swarm advanced toward Moscow, gliding low and fast. When they crossed the defensive perimeter at 11pm, the city's most advanced air defense system reacted instantly. Russia's S-400 batteries, designed to track bombers and ballistic missiles, locked onto the swarm. To operators, the targets looked amateurish, almost like a distraction. Training had conditioned them to measure threats by size, speed, and altitude. These drones appeared primitive in comparison, but their presence demanded a response. Confident in their superiority, a Russian commander authorized an immediate engagement. Massive 40 N6 missiles, each worth millions, launched into the sky at Mach 12. Their exhaust plumes lit the night like vertical bolts of lightning. Within seconds, about half of the small drones were obliterated. On Russian radar, half the threat vanished in one decisive moment. The crews saw it as confirmation of the system's overwhelming strength. In Ukraine's command center, however, the destruction was recorded as a planned success. The S-400 had reacted exactly as intended, expending some of the most expensive missiles in Russia's arsenal to neutralize drones that cost a few hundred dollars each. The first phase of the operation had pushed Moscow's elite defenses into wasteful action. The second phase was about to begin. The remaining calibre drones flew deeper toward the city and entered the engagement range of the Pantsir S-1 systems that lined the suburbs. These close-range weapons were Russia's workhorses, responsible for neutralizing small, fast threats. Here, Ukraine executed its real deception. Operators activated spoofing software that altered the drone's electronic signatures. On radar, the drones suddenly resembled something much larger, a cruise missile or even a low-flying helicopter. Inside Pantsir crew's scopes, the threat level spiked instantly. Algorithms flagged the targets as high priority. Human operators, drilled to follow procedure in moments of crisis, didn't hesitate. A command to open fire likely echoed through the comms. Dozens of 9M311 missiles streaked upward, each costing as much as a luxury vehicle. But they weren't hunting drones anymore. They were chasing illusions manufactured by Ukrainian software. The Pantsir units poured fire into empty air, reacting to echoing signatures instead of physical targets. Within 90 seconds, the last surviving Calibri drone was destroyed. The operators, relieved, saw their screens clear again. Nearly half of their missile stocks had been spent in under two minutes. Russian officials quickly embraced the outcome. Moscow's mayor, Sergei Sobyanin, 
Later, Moscow's mayor Sergei Sobyanin stated that the attack had been repelled, but the strike they thought they had defeated was never intended to break through. Its purpose was to drain ammunition, create confusion, and set the stage for the true offensive. Two hours earlier, a separate fleet of 60 Luti drones had launched from Sumi. Unlike the Calabrese, these moved along an entirely different route. While Moscow's defenses were preoccupied, the Lutiers had flown low along the contours of Russian oil pipelines. The pipelines served as both navigation guides and radar shadows, helping the drones remain undetected by distant sensors. When the Lutiers finally began their ascent, the timing was deliberate. Just as Pantsir units were reloading and their radars were settling back to idle mode, 60 new targets appeared from the west, larger, faster, and unmistakably hostile. The sudden appearance erased any feeling of victory in Moscow's command center. The scene shifted from confident relief to sharp dread. The first wave had been a decoy. This was the true strike. With the Pantsirs still scrambling, the defense fell to the short-range Tor M2 systems, precise, rapid, and deadly. These were the final automated gatekeepers protecting the capital. As the Lutiers broke formation and scattered into independent trajectories, their mesh network worked to distribute flight paths across unpredictable angles. Operators in Ukraine watched with silent intensity, seeing their strike force sliced apart by the defensive barrage. One after another, Lutiers were destroyed. Explosions dotted the sky. The number of active drones dropped rapidly. 50, then 40, then 30. In less than two minutes, 34 drones were gone. At this pace, the attack risked complete failure. But the next development was one Ukraine had anticipated. Russian commanders activated the Krasuka 4 electronic warfare system, unleashing a broadband barrage of radio energy designed to blind and deafen any aircraft reliant on communication links. Drone feeds inside the Ukrainian command center dissolved instantly into static. 80% of remaining drones lost signal at once. For Ukrainian operators, it was the worst case scenario. The drones were now flying blind, yet the swarm didn't collapse. Cut off from their controllers, the remaining drones switched to autonomous coordination. They shared what data they still held, triangulating positions using internal gyroscopes and the last reliable GPS points. Instead of scattering, they tightened their formation like a school of fish under threat, relying on collective navigation. Russian electronic warfare officers likely expected the drones to drop from the sky. Instead, they watched them adapt. The jamming had not broken the attack. It had forced the swarm's intelligence to shift from ground-based oversight to an airborne mesh. Drones continued on course. Through the collapsing cloud of missiles and electronic interference, six Lutius emerged into Moscow's final defensive perimeter. With missiles partly depleted and jammers mitigated, the city relied on its last option, rapid-fire cannons mounted on Pantsir vehicles positioned near key suburbs. The cannons opened fire, launching dense streams of 30mm rounds. Four of the six drones were shredded instantly, disintegrating mid-air. But two remained. Damaged and trailing smoke, they continued forward, closing in on their assigned targets, the fuel depots at Sheremetyevo International Airport and the Transneft Pipeline Hub in Zelenograd. Moments before impact, Ukrainian operators regained partial connections, just long enough to guide the drones into their final dives. They didn't need direct hits, they only needed proximity. Both drones were torn apart by cannon fire, several hundred feet above their targets. Their warheads didn't create massive explosions. Instead, the falling debris delivered powerful kinetic impacts. At Sheremetyevo, drone wreckage crashed directly into the pumping station that fed the airport's fuel system. A small fire ignited, activating the facility's entire emergency response system. Foam cannons triggered, valves sealed. The airport's refueling network shut down completely, grounding all flights and delaying dozens more across Europe. In Zelenograd, Debris from the second drone ruptured a feeder line of the Transneft pipeline system, which carried 500,000 barrels of oil per day. A localized fire erupted. The pipeline section went into automatic lockdown, halting flow across the affected region. The damage was not catastrophic, but highly strategic. 
Moscow's triumphant narrative evaporated in minutes. Videos of the burning pipeline and grounded aircraft spread across social media. Residents awoke to the smell of smoke and the sound of emergency sirens, realizing that the war they had watched from a distance was now touching their own city again. The event echoed earlier attacks, including the high-profile strike on the Kremlin roof, a moment that had prompted vast new investments in air defenses and rooftop missile platforms. Yet all that spending had failed to prevent this breach. The night's numbers told a stark story. Russia had launched a $50 million strike on Ukraine and then spent perhaps $200 million defending Moscow from a counter-attack. Additional losses came from disrupted oil movement and grounded flights. The estimated financial toll reached a quarter of a billion dollars. Ukraine, in turn, spent roughly $2 million, a hundred drones, a disguised truck, and a coordinated plan had produced a return on investment of over 100 to 1. The operation underscored a growing truth in modern warfare. Technological improvisation and strategic misdirection can outweigh brute force. The European Union pledged another 1 billion euros in support for Ukrainian drone development, recognizing the broader implications for future conflicts. This strike was not about raw destruction. It was about exposing vulnerabilities, forcing costly reactions, and demonstrating how a smaller force could outthink a larger one. The message was unmistakable. In modern conflict, innovation can reshape the battlefield more profoundly than firepower. And as the night smoke drifted across Moscow's skyline, the question hanging over the world was not whether another strike would come, but how the next escalation might unfold.